Hi guys! I don't know why I made that so dramatic. I just have a lot of energy today. Probably because I haven't been here for a while. I've been out gallivanting around town. Gallivanting and doing lesbian things. Sorry, that's a bit of a joke from one of my favourite TikToks. The lesbian you're attempting to contact is currently preoccupied gallivanting around town, partaking in lesbian-related activities. Please leave a message or send them a text and they'll be with you as soon as they can. Okay, but actually I wanted to come on here today to talk about quite a serious topic. It's a topic that's actually really difficult for me to talk about and I do want to preface this video with a trigger warning because I am going to be talking about issues that fall under the umbrella of sexual dissociation and issues to do with sex and consent. So please go gently with this one or feel free to skip it and go to a less intense heavy video. I want to talk about sex as a form of self-harm. I think one of the hardest things for me to kind of reckon with since I've come out as a lesbian is how I was able to have sex with men for so long. During the years that I was having sex with men, I feel like at times I slipped into playing a kind of character. Partly this is due to the fact that I have BPD. I've spoken about it in one of my last videos. If you want to watch that, I'll link it somewhere up here. BPD stands for Borderline Personality Disorder. And people who have BPD tend to have a very unstable sense of self or no real identity. And that has certainly been the case with me for most of my life. It's probably realistically only been in the last couple of years that I have developed a very stable sense of self. I really feel strong in knowing who I am. I feel really comfortable in myself and confident in being able to articulate who I am. And perhaps it sounds a little odd, but if you had have asked me just a few years ago, Who are you? What do you like? What are your values? What are your hobbies? I wouldn't have been able to answer. Now, of course, everyone through life, your identity and your sense of self is always evolving and changing. That's so normal. None of us is the same person today that we were 10 years ago. But the difference with BPD is it's much more extreme. In the early stages of treating my BPD and definitely before I got my BPD diagnosis, I would often look to the people around me for a sense of self. I would sometimes absorb and mirror people's personalities back to them. Sometimes I would look to movies and TV shows and find a character that I liked and try to emulate that character. If you are to look back at videos I made three, four, five years ago, I am essentially unrecognizable. Not just because I look different, because my appearance has also dramatically changed over the years as part of not having a stable sense of self, but my actual personality itself is completely unrecognizable. Yes, guys, I'm having a lazy day and I haven't made my bed, okay? I just can't be bothered today, so it just, my backdrop doesn't look as pretty. I'm sure you guys will manage to deal with it. All right, let's get into the story. For that reason, it's really hard for me to watch back a lot of old content, and some of you will have noticed, and some of you have commented, that I, uh, about a year and a half ago now, deleted a lot of content off this channel. And that's because a lot of that content was really, really hard for me to watch. Because when I watch it, I don't see myself. I see someone who is a shell, someone who is desperately trying to find an identity to cling onto. And one of those identities that I leaned into for quite a few years was this identity of this absolutely boy crazed, sex crazed person. Quick interruption to let you guys know, today's video is brought to you by my friends at Moments Condoms. And Moments Condoms have some really exciting news. They have just launched Moments Pleasure Toys. Whether you're going solo or you're with your bae, their toys are going to make sure you have lots of unforgettable moments. The lineup includes Vibin, Baddie, CEO, and Mood. The Vibin, it's the perfect ergonomic design for handheld clitoral stimulation with or without a partner. 
with 10 different vibration modes, a wireless remote and vibrating tips for enhanced clitoral stimulation, you cannot go wrong with the Bardi. The CEO is a tongue-shaped clitoral vibrator with a vibrating tip to provide enhanced stimulation. Mood isn't your average sex toy. It has two separate ends for double the fun. This is the perfect toy for taking partnered sex to the next level. They've just launched, but the range is already selling out. So get in quick and head to momentscondoms.com.au to stock up on some self-love. When I started becoming more well-known as a writer, I wrote a story about going on a date with a guy and having a one night stand. And that story blew up. It was hugely popular. And I realized in that moment that if I talked about having sex with men and loving sex with men, I could get attention. And that's hard to admit because maybe it sounds a bit shallow, although I kind of have mixed ideas about this as well because we have this whole idea as a society that wanting attention is innately bad and particularly for women. Women are often called attention seekers as a kind of insult. It's like the worst thing that you can be called is saying, Oh, you're just doing that for attention. You're an attention seeker. But attention is a basic human need. We, we need attention to psychologically survive and, and grow and develop as people. It's very obvious when people are put into isolation where they don't have attention, they start to go insane because we need it. So I always find it strange that it's seen as a bad thing to admit that you want attention. But I guess because I have borderline personality disorder, the ways at which I have sought to get attention have been a lot of the time very dysfunctional and not things that particularly served me and often things that harmed me and made my life many, many times more miserable. And certainly leaning into that character of the boy crazed sex crazed woman is something that made my life quite miserable and i've never spoken about it i guess because it's actually really hard for me to think about because when i think about the sex that i was having back then it was absolutely a form of self-harm. I was not present in that sex. And I only realized that after I spoke to a therapist about it and she asked me to describe the experience of what it was like having sex with a man. And when I described it, she said, It sounds like you were kind of dissociating. And if you don't know what dissociating means, it just essentially means to kind of leave your body a little bit. It sort of feels like you're, like you are performing. And it's particularly, I guess, interesting, ironic, because I have spent a lot of my career trying to encourage women to not have performative sex and to have sex that is for their own pleasure and joy and to find the things that they like. Here I was promoting this message of being sexually empowered while I myself was feeling dead inside while I was having sex and feeling lost and confused, but feeling like that was, that was the personality that I needed to cling on to at the time. Okay, my camera battery just died and I had to recharge it because I never seem to be prepared to sit down and film. I seem to constantly sit down and film with like 10% battery power. Having a mental illness and especially having a personality disorder has really complicated my relationship with sex. I also think just in general, living in a patriarchal culture that essentially teaches women that we don't really exist or have any real value, that we're not really seen until we are chosen or wanted or desired by a man. And that until that happens, we're largely invisible. I think that also really complicates sex for people with vulvas in general. And so for me, sex always felt like a way to confirm that I wasn't invisible, that I meant something, that I was seen. And I think this happens to a lot of women, even women that aren't gay or queer, even straight women, is that we confuse wanting men to sexually desire us with having actual sexual desire for men. Now my alarm's going off. I just cannot catch a break today with filming, evidently. Around the time that I first got my diagnosis for BPD, I had 
been feeling a lot of distress around sex and around my sex life in general. I didn't have a therapist yet. I hadn't really done therapy at that point. And so I went to see this life coach and I spoke about my distress. And at the time he suggested that what I had was a sex addiction. If you've followed my work for a while, you'll know that I actually vehemently disagree with the entire concept of sex addiction because it pathologizes people having a lot of sex. It suggests that there is a right amount and a wrong amount of sex and masturbation to be having. Like this amount is good and healthy, but if we have any more, it means we're an addict. I believe that sex and pleasure are incredibly individual, personal things. And we shouldn't be putting guidelines around how much or little people should have. It's just another consequence of living in a sex negative culture that seeks to demonize sex and pleasure and people that seek out sex and pleasure and just make us feel generally shit about it and shroud the whole thing in shame. However, I didn't always think this way because five years ago when I was first told that perhaps I had a sex addiction, I immediately went online and looked up the symptoms of sex addiction. And I'm putting those in quotation marks because like I said, I do not believe in the construct of sex addiction. And it also is not supported in the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. But when I looked up those symptoms, I felt for the first time in my life seen, like I had some kind of understanding about myself, which was huge for me as someone who really had never had a sense of identity. A lot of the so-called core symptoms of sex addiction talk about sex being either an empty or distressing event. And I'd been having all of this sex with men that had made me feel deeply empty and deeply numb and more confused than ever about who the hell I was, even though I was making content about how amazing my sex life was and how much I loved it. Making tutorials on giving blowjobs and presenting myself as the blowjob queen when those things were making me feel dehumanized. Not that there's anything wrong with giving your partner a blowjob, but because these were things that I did not actually deep down inside want to be doing. It was like a kind of choreographed dance where I was going through the movements, but I hadn't realized that's what I was doing. And I think a big part of that is because we live in a culture that really conditions women to believe it's our role to sexually satisfy men, to not only be sexually desirable and sexually available to them, but to make sure that we are satisfying them. That sex is all about them and their pleasure. And if you've been following this channel for any amount of time, you already know about the orgasm gap. And it is a term that came out of the biggest study to date that has ever been done into sexuality and pleasure. And it confirms the fact that we live in a culture that prioritizes men's pleasure at the cost of women's pleasure because it shows that straight men orgasm 95% of the time during partnered sex while straight women orgasm just 65% of the time. And so it's really not uncommon for women to have sex, not only that they don't really enjoy, but that they also don't even really want to be having. But the reality is when we have sex, that we actually don't want, sex that doesn't bring us pleasure or joy, sex that might even be uncomfortable or painful, but that we continue on with without even telling our partners about our discomfort, or sex that makes us walk away feeling violated or dehumanized or lesser than, even if that sex was technically consensual. It's my belief that that sex is a form of self-harm. And because I was so convinced that I had solved my problem, that I had worked out what was causing me so much pain and distress and discomfort and numbness around sex. And because I am a content creator and I am in the media, I wrote about it and I talked about it. And I even did a TV segment about it. And 
I very unfortunately stumbled across that old TV segment recently and it was very, very difficult to watch. Not just because it was unbelievably cringe to see myself publicly identify as a sex addict when I strongly disagree with the entire idea of sex addiction today, but because watching that TV segment is watching myself in the grips of my BPD when I did not have an identity at all and I was searching for one outside of myself. And I think the most challenging thing about that is because of the career I'm in, a lot of my own journey of getting diagnosed with BPD and going through the recovery process, which I will be on forever because there is of course no cure for mental illness. And a lot of my own confusion and struggles with my sexual identity and just sex in general is still out there. And I don't have the power to scrub it all off the internet. I would if I could, because it is so hard for me to see that content. I just see someone who was constantly contorting themselves to try to become a person that would be acceptable or lovable. I know not everyone will agree with this and perhaps it's a little controversial to say, but I ultimately see all of the sex that I had with men as a form of self-harm because even when it was with someone who loved and respected me and wanted nothing more than for me to feel comfortable and to experience pleasure, I wasn't present. My body was trying to tell me, but I just wouldn't listen to it. For almost two years, I had every test possible done to find out why every time I had sex, my vagina would burn for sometimes hours afterward. I was tested for every STI. I did thrush treatments. I did every type of treatment and test that you can imagine. Finally, a doctor actually thought to ask me if I ever got wet during sex. And I said, no. I don't. And she said, you know, if you have sex where you are dry, it is going to be causing a lot of friction and that is going to cause pain and stinging afterwards. And from that point on, I was the lube queen. I just assumed I was someone that needed a lot of lube. And I do want to just say here, there is nothing wrong with needing lube. I am still a huge advocate for using lube because women are not human waterfalls. We can't simply get super wet every time we are horny. Sometimes we get super turned on and our vaginas just don't respond because of where we are in our hormonal cycle or maybe because we're going through menopause or we've recently been sick or because of the medication we're on. There are so many factors that can influence our body's natural lubrication levels. But if for years on end, you are never getting lubricated, not in any of the times you're having sex, there is never any natural lubrication. That is something to examine. And that was the case for me. And it wasn't until I started having sex with women that I realized my vagina was capable of getting extremely wet without a lot of effort, like with like just someone like taking their shirt off, my vagina was pretty ready to go in terms of lubrication. I've been publicly out for just over two and a half years now, and I'm still unpacking so much of that. And so much of it is still so hard to reflect back on. And I'm sharing this because as part of my Nadia 2.0 era of this YouTube channel, I want to be more real with you guys than ever before. And that means being authentic about some of the older content I made. If you are a woman watching right now who is starting to think that maybe you don't know what you like and maybe you haven't been having sex that you like, my number one piece of advice to you would be masturbate. It is the best way to get comfortable in your body and to get to know the exact things that make your body feel joy and pleasure. And this is a nice little segue to remind you that my friends at Moments have now launched a sex toy line. It is an amazing range of toys and they're all super reasonably priced. And when you buy one of their toys or any of their products, you will also be supporting my channel because that's what keeps partners like Moments continuing to work with me so I can 
put out this content. If there's anything else that you would like to see more of from me on this channel as we do move into this new Nadia 2 point era phase, then please let me know in the comment section down below. I want to give you content that is sex positive and educational, but is also real and insightful and is less about telling you exactly what you should and shouldn't be doing and more about sharing my own insights and my own takeaways from my journey discovering my sexuality, which quite frankly is an ongoing process. And I think should be an ongoing process for all of us. I think we all should seek to keep examining the ideas we have around sex and the way we approach pleasure and the way we define ourselves. It is a Friday night here in Sydney, Australia. So I am about to go and do my Friday night de-stress, which is to have a Maz with one of my moments toys and then go and catch up with my friends for a couple of glasses of wine. So I hope you have um, a very de-stressing night yourself or day, wherever you are. I'll see you all in the next video. Love you lots. Mwah.